Section 22 of Six Radical Thinkers by John McCunn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 6 The Political Idealism of T. H. Green. Part 2. Nor must we suppose that this glowing and grateful appreciation of what life, even with all its obstructive imperfections, has to give, rests merely upon a perception of the recognized value of such things as are enumerated in this passage for it is time now to go to the root of the matter and to say that analysis of experience both on the lesser scale of individual morality and on the larger scale of national history had convinced green that moral and political institutions were more than the resultants of secular forces behind them and within them he discerned and he claimed this as a result of analysis a universal spiritual force a divine idea an eternal consciousness for even if on a first view of it the course of history might seem to be no more than the secular product of finite human wills and circumstances it was precisely his analysis of the action of human wills as found in moral and political experience that convinced green that neither human achievement nor aspiration could be made intelligible except through the presence in so-called secular affairs of that universal spiritual force to which the religious consciousness had never failed to bear witness for it is not simply because institutions are the work of many hands and many minds which wrought their best in the generations that are gone that the social system into which we come is entitled to our respect it is also and ultimately for the deeper reason that it is the work of men who in all they thought and did and endured were ultimately dependent even when they might be but dimly or not at all conscious of the fact upon that supreme source of all life which in the philosophy of green appears variously as the divine idea the universal spiritual force, the spiritual principle in nature and life, the eternal consciousness. The dependence of man on God is, as he thinks, a fundamental fact of human experience. Hence that passage in which, in repudiation of the notion that either the world of nature or the given social system is ultimately hostile and obstructive to human will and aspiration, he speaks of the so-called outer world as a means through which the deity who works unseen behind it pours the truth and love which transforms man's capabilities into actualities it is so that the very force of circumstances which may seem to thwart and resist the passion for a better life can on a deeper insight be recognized as the material which in the divine plan has to be transmuted to the service of higher ends and hence that other passage in which he vindicates in noble words the actual social achievement of mankind everything he there writes that makes life human the institutions by which relations dear and all the charities of husband son and brother first were known which create honour and dishonour loyalty and disloyalty justice and injustice which makes it possible to die for one's country or to be false to it to sacrifice oneself to a cause or a cause to oneself to defraud the fatherless and widow or befriend them all these the animals know not they are not primary but derived not given by nature but constituted by man and when he says they are constituted by man he is not thinking of man as a being who can find nothing in the universe higher than himself it is always of man as even in the insignificance of his finitude participant in a universal spirit which works within him and is thereby rendered capable of social achievements which in permanence and value far surpass his conscious purpose or plans perhaps he says in a sentence in which the perhaps introduces what was with him a subtle conviction on thinking the matter out we should find ourselves compelled to regard the idea of social good as a communication to the human consciousness a consciousness developing itself in time from an eternally complete consciousness 
nor does he lack the full courage of his convictions here he sees the difficulties and goes to meet them he knows well the ferocious and greedy and selfish passions in which the existing social system has its origin the earth hunger of conquering hordes the passions of military despots the pride avarice vindictiveness of kings the lust for pleasure the greed for gain he minimizes none of them he meets them by the contention that on a closer examination even these things may be said he adopts the phrase to be overruled for good for as he reads the record even the most selfish passions that operate in the history of social evolution however they may stain the characters of those who felt them become in their own despite the ministers and instruments of social impulses and ideas which make for better things napoleon to take his leading instance may have been possessed of a personal passion for glory but the selfish passion nevertheless identified itself with the aggrandizement of his country caesar when he crossed the rubicon may have thought first and last of victory and power but he founded the empire and the empire brought to europe the blessings of roman law this is the line of thought that green follows throughout he never dreams of disputing the part that selfish passions play in the evolution of institutions he was not blind to facts if we call him optimist at all it must be with the reservation that his optimism was anything rather than easy or light-hearted yet behind all the selfish passions which darken the course of history his analysis disclosed to him two other things which he grasped with characteristic tenacity the one was the steady trend of all communities from the family onwards toward higher conceptions of a public good the other the imminence in this whole forward struggling movement of that eternal consciousness which was his philosophical synonym for god on occasion green goes further even than this for there are times when this conviction of the dependence of finite human wills upon the infinite spirit leads him as it is apt to lead all profoundly religious minds close up to the borders of a resigned optimism which might seem it is only seeming in this case the utmost antithesis of the radical passion for reform this is so where he urges that there is room even in the genius and the reformer for a wise passiveness to the heavenly influences which are ever about him it is so still more when he is delineating the true attitude of the religious mind toward the work and the workers of the world amongst whom a man's lot is cast the least experienced among us he says in one of his occasional religious addresses knows that it is not in the outward cast of a life but in the way of living it that the spirit of a man is shown and that there are those about him in whose characters though with no outward mark of distinction and perhaps under a surface of yet unconquered weaknesses the love of god and the brethren is the ruling power all he has to do is to share in the higher spirit of such men he need not make a rush after the heroic or seek to jump out of his circumstances the end to be attained is indeed infinite but he need not therefore vainly try to swell his own effort to a like infinity for it is already attained for him the sacrifice has been offered the goal has been won god is forever perfect light and love it is for us under the limitations of a petty human life to take such personal hold on this perfection as may fit us for its fuller communication when in his good time these limitations are taken away these it must be confessed do not read like the words of a radical they are more akin to quietism than to radicalism and they may serve admirably to accentuate the remark already quoted that green's radicalism was of a peculiar kind so peculiar some may think as to cease to be radicalism at all in any reasonable acceptation of that word green used to advise his pupils to read burke and so far as we have gone it might seem that in the profoundly religious complexion of his thought in his respect for the work of those who have gone before 
and in his reverent appreciation of existing social and political institutions, there is more of conservative Burke than of radical Bentham in his philosophy. This, however, would be a flagrant misconception. For if the course of history and the growth of institutions be thus the revelation of a spiritual principle, which uses men and societies of men as its organs, this is not a fact to be sought for only in the past. The revelation is not over and done with. Why should it? Rather is it, as the years roll on, increasing in fullness and in clearness. With the deepening of political thought, with the growth of political institutions, with the increase of the volume of national life, it is a greater thing for the citizen of today than it ever was to his forerunners. Who will say that it will not be greater far in the days to come? Green, it is true, was no believer in special revelations of the divine, but it was because he held that there is a progressive revelation for ever going on to which no final limits can be set. For there is nothing against which, in all his writings, he more vehemently protests than the notion that in these latter days we are somehow shut out from the perennial spiritual influences which he believed to be written, if only men have eyes to see it, upon the whole course of moral and political evolution. The essential dependence of the human will on its divine source, the constant presence of a universal spiritual principle in human life, is the core of his entire ethical and political thought. It is this that has made his teaching, despite its heterodoxy, which is pronounced enough, welcome to many leaders of the religious world, as it also makes it easy for himself, and it is a strongly marked characteristic, to pass from the language of metaphysics into the more familiar phrases of the religious consciousness. Say not in thine own heart, who shall ascend into heaven or descend into the deep to find God in the height of another world or in the depths of nature? The word of God is very nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. It is the word that has been made man, that has been uttering itself in all the high endeavor, the long-suffering love, the devoted search for truth, which have so far moralized mankind and that now speaks in your conscience. It is the God in you which strives for communication with God. Speak to him, thou, for he hears, and spirit with spirit can meet. Closer is he than breathing, and nearer than hands and feet. Not as to the sensual ear, nor necessarily through the stinted expression of verbal signs, but as a man communes with his own heart, you may speak to God. These words which come in a religious address are used with reference to the moral, which is also the religious life of individuals. But their application does not end there. Being a thinker, Green was not the man to carry one set of fundamental conceptions into one domain and shut them out from another. The same conscious dependence upon a universal spiritual source, which is the strength of the personal will, is the strength likewise of the political reformer. It was the strength of the heroes of the commonwealth. It may be the strength and inspiration also of the reformer of all ages, even though he may not, like Cromwell and his followers, clothe his aspirations in biblical language or in the terms of evangelical theology. For it is precisely through this conscious dependence upon a universal spirit that there comes into human life that element in which lies the nerve of all progress, that element is the presence and everlasting vitality of ideals. Let all who would understand Green banish at once from their minds the notion that a political ideal is no more than a subjective dream or aspiration in the very fashioning of which the mind loses touch with reality and passes into the shadowy land of fantasy. To frame ideals, Green believes, to be of the essence of man's nature. We find this if we analyze the will. For from first to last, will, even from its beginnings in instinct and desire, is a faculty of ideals. Always it sets some kind of ideal before it. 
the ideal may be nothing more than a decent family life or a forecast of less squalid surroundings or it may be the splendid visions of the reformers and prophets of the world or it may be one or other of the manifold plans schemes or prophecies of social betterment that lie between these two extremes but some ideal there always is the entire second book of the prolegomena to ethics is written to prove that reason is and he is never weary of repeating it constitutive of motive and that the way in which it becomes so is by transmuting what otherwise would be blind animal appetites into desires for ends ends which are always even in their lowliest phases ideal this psychological analysis of will finds confirmation in biography and history be it the savage tribesman or the civilized citizen be it the leader of men or his humblest follower the service of ideals lofty or lowly is common to all and this is a fact that they can no more disclaim than they can abjure the idealizing reason and imagination which lift them above the brute and wherever present an ideal acts in the same way it creates that pregnant contrast between the ideal and the actual it begets that antithetic thought this is what we ought to be this is what we are whereby mankind have been throughout all the ages plunged into a saving discontent shaken out of an ignoble lethargy and lotus-eating and nerved for reform mixed with illusions our ideals may be and even with fatuities we may smile at times to think of them in retrospect but let no one think that they are therefore shadows whatever they may become to dreamers they are to all men of action whether they be thinking of the betterment of family or parish of city or of nation nothing less than the efforts of the human spirit to apprehend that greater and more satisfying reality after which all finite spirits forever strive they are attempts to express in thought and imagery finite anticipations of that reality which will one day be matter of actual experience in that far-off day namely when thanks to human courage and pertinacity the divine idea the universal spiritual force in which all that lives participates shall have found a fuller revelation in social institutions and in the souls of men than it has hitherto found in the imperfect state of existing human affairs in this aspect an ideal is not only a loftier thing it is also a thing more real than is actual human life to any one who understands a process of development says green in a pregnant sentence the result being developed is the reality apply this sweeping formula politically and we have the deeply significant doctrine that the potentialities which are already here and now struggling alike in individual and national life for fuller expression and ever and anon as in the men of the type of vane or mazzini bursting out into mysticism fanaticism and revolution point onwards with no uncertain finger to the reality of an end which though it can only be realized after many days and never in all its fullness yet reveals at every fresh step in its actualization how meagre and unreal by comparison are the earlier stages in the light of the fruition of the later for development is more than change it implies direction and though the process is always costly though as it runs its course much is lost that never comes again yet the trend is persistently such that at any given stage a nation cannot any more than an individual wish that the shadow on the dial should go backward it cannot because its citizens are conscious that each step onwards makes its life more real because richer in the essential elements of national existence they may pay their tribute to the past they may even lament the disappearance of the days that are no more but they cannot really desire to return to them because they know that retrogression would mean impoverishment of life hence the significance of green's remark for his words carry nothing less than a salutary inversion of the relation between the ideal and the actual 
as this is popularly conceived. It follows from them that the hours in which a man is holding fast to his ideal become the hours in which his grasp of reality is at its strongest, and that the hours in which he suffers his ideal to be obscured by the illusions of the present are the hours in which his grasp of reality is weakest. Nor is it possible to do justice to the reality of the reformer's ideals till full recognition is accorded to this fact. End of section 22. Section 23 of Six Radical Thinkers by John McCunn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 6. The Political Idealism of T. H. Green. Part 3. For this is the paradox of human life we find the ideal in experience or not at all where else can we find it what other revelations are there but the revelations of experience yes we find the ideal in experience and yet we recognize it as more real than any or all of the particular experiences in which we find it yet the paradox is no mystery when we see a common man living and working for what he means his boys and girls to become long after he has passed from their midst, or the citizen whose most cherished hopes, whose best energies are directed upon distant political or social ends, whose full fruition he shall never see, or a soldier whose life is freely rendered up for his country's cause, or a leader like Mazzini, who persists without faltering in the face of seemingly irretrievable disaster, it is reasonable to regard these things as evidence that individual human lives are borne along and upheld by a spirit that is working toward results far greater and more truly real than anything that has yet been reflected in the small mirror of actual human achievement. The very magnitude of dutiful demand which this spirit makes upon individual wills, and the entire willingness with which the citizen responds, even to the most arduous of the demands laid upon him, unite to suggest that the ideals which with inexhaustible vitality shape themselves in finite imaginations are nothing less than attempts to give form and a body to that infinite spirit through whose indwelling energy the generations of mankind are swept along toward the realization of ends greater than they know. It is thus at any rate that Green regards ideals. Never are they to him mere forecasts, guesses, gropings, projected by human imagination upon the darkness of the future. They would be better described as revelations to human reason and imagination of that larger spiritual life in which every son of man participates and in which every thinking man may know that he participates. For there are, according to Green, three great revelations of reality the revelation through science, the revelation through creative art, the revelation through human action and especially through that service of ideals by which life and history are made. One may not say that Green thought the last to be the greatest of the three, but it was not the least. To one who was full of sympathy with his fellow men, he says, the most welcome manifestation of the divine idea would be the political life of mankind. We are now perhaps in a position to understand why it is that there are two sides to Green's political doctrine. In one aspect, as we have seen, he is conservative. Tabula rasa and new beginnings have no charm for him. He neither vilifies the past nor belittles the present. And on this side he parts company forever with Godwin and Payne and Bentham and all their following, who, through lamentable limitation, wrote as if sympathy with their country's past history was treachery to the radical cause, and respect for existing institutions, and admission that the reformer's occupation was gone. How could it be otherwise with a man to whom the political life of mankind was a revelation of the divine idea? But then there is the other side, for that overflowing gratitude for what the past has done for us, 
that readiness to do justice to our social heritage as citizens of an ancient commonwealth that respect for existing institutions as the fruits of long experience even that philosophic conviction that all our noisy years are but moments in an infinitely larger life these things hang no weight upon green's aspirations for the future they have the contrary effect they inspire him with new hopes to his large outlook they become the first fruits and earnest of better things to come to him they are experiential proof of the presence and power in human affairs of the one everlasting spiritual principle which still speaks and will never cease to speak not only in the lives of the prophet and the reformer but in the unobtrusive civic patriotism of the humblest of their followers these two sides of green's political thought met in his own political life sober-mindedness was of the essence of his character he had a large toleration for men and institutions no one was less of a visionary the rush after the heroic the leap out of one's circumstances was to him no necessary condition of good citizenship there is no other genuine enthusiasm of humanity he once wrote when pleading for the reasonableness of respectability than one which has travelled the common highway of reason the life of the good neighbour and honest citizen and can never forget that it is still only on a further stage of the same journey yet there were times when that passion for the ideal that rational faith in the future which was always burning within him broke through the limits of utterance within which in the interests of sober practicality and from an instinctive shrinking from all large and loud professions it was ordinarily content to be confined with all his firm grip on fact as one of his friends remarks he had the enthusiastic movement of the world's poetry in him one instance of this may be found in the end of the essay on the value and influence of works of fiction he has been lamenting that modern fiction shows a grievous declension of the spirit of creative art it is a popular form of literature and in becoming such it has descended to a delineation of life in which the higher intellect can find no satisfaction comparable with what is furnished by the epic and the drama yet he will not believe this is permanent he cannot think that the popularization of ideas can permanently mean their degradation and so he goes on yet we hold fast to the faith that the cultivation of the masses which has for the present superseded the development of the individual will in its maturity produce some higher type of individual manhood than any which the old world has known we may rest in the same faith in tracing the history of literature in the novel we must admit that the creative faculty has taken a lower form than it held in the epic and the tragedy but since in this form it acts on more extensive material and reaches more men we may well believe that this temporary declension is preparatory to some higher development when the poet shall idealize life without making abstraction of any of its elements and when the secret of existence which he now speaks to the inward ear of a few will be proclaimed on the housetops to the common intelligence of mankind a second instance occurs significantly enough in the end of his address on the occasion of the opening of the oxford high school for boys the institution which next perhaps to his college lay near to his heart our high school then he said may fairly claim to be helping forward the time when every oxford citizen will have open to him at least the precious companionship of the best books in his own language and the knowledge necessary to make him independent when all who have a special taste for learning will have open to them what has hitherto been unpleasantly called the education of gentlemen I confess to hoping for a time when that phrase will have lost its meaning, because the sort of education which alone makes the gentleman in any true sense will be within the reach of all. As it was, the aspiration of Moses that all the Lord's people should be prophets, so, with all seriousness and reverence, we may hope and pray for a condition of English society 
in which all honest citizens will recognize themselves and be recognized by each other as gentlemen. No one is likely to deny that these aspirations are worthy of radicalism at its best. The misgiving in some minds may rather be lest radicalism may not prove itself worthy of them. It is therefore natural to ask what the reasons of this sober-minded thinker were for his serious belief in the coming of a day when such things would be possible. And this question will best be answered by examining somewhat more closely what Green's political ideal was, and more especially why it was so uncompromisingly democratic. It is not necessary here to enter greatly into details. These belong rather to Green's political program than to his political ideal. And in any case, there is nothing in the details that strike one as distinctive of Green more than of some other radicals of this day. Bright appears to have been the politician of his time whom he most admired. He admired him, Nettleship tells us, for his belief in the moral responsibility of nations, his love of the people, his unclerical piety, the noble simplicity and restrained passion of his eloquence. And one of his friends, while expressing the opinion that it was not likely that either Bright or Cobden could understand, the process by which Green's opinions were obtained, nor the arguments by which they were defended, has remarked that almost all his definite opinions might be endorsed by Bright and Cobden. This is true. A conviction that there were hardships and wrongs to be redressed, a strong sympathy with the middle classes and the working men, a frank acceptance of free trade, a respect for nonconformity, a dislike of ecclesiasticism, a belief in parliamentary reform, land law reform, and national education, in Irish land acts and Irish church disestablishment. They are all found in green. So is a deep sympathetic interest in American democracy. Not least, there is a decided distrust of the kind of foreign policy associated with the names of Palmerston and Disraeli. Let the flag of England, he once wrote in an early essay that has not survived, be dragged through the mud, rather than that sixpence be added to the taxes which weigh on the poor. The outburst is startling, and to estimate it aright, one would need to remember the precise juncture in politics that provoked it nor would it be fair to press an utterance penned for the unguarded controversies of a private essay society. It did not, at any rate, prevent him from taking Cromwell as one of his heroes, or of approving the armed coercion of South by North in the American struggle, the fortunes of which we are told he followed with the ardor of a citizen soldier and the prescience of a strategist. Yet it remains significant of a peculiar detestation of war, and of a conviction, he labors at much length to prove it in his latest work, that war always implies culpability somewhere, in which he is not surpassed by either of the twin leaders of the Manchester School. The point of distinctive interest, therefore, in regard to Green's ideal, is not the details, but rather those larger features of it, not to be found in Bright or Cobden, upon which the details, the common property of many radicals, will be found to depend. Foremost amongst these is the stress he constantly laid upon social and political institutions. No political writer ever valued institutions more. There used to be a significant emphasis in the very way in which he pronounced the word, and we have partly seen the reason why. For like Burke, for whom he had a profound admiration, he saw in his country's institutions, as we have seen, no mere secular product of many human minds and many human wills, but rather the results of the action of that universal spirit, that divine tactic, as Burke called it, which through the instrumentality of human wills operates throughout the whole history and growth of states. Yet it is not for this reason solely or even mainly that he values institutions be it family or property or political party, or church or legal system or charitable organization, 
the value of each and all turns finally on what it does and promises to do for the lives of citizens no one could be less disposed to turn an institution into an end in itself no matter how imposing its history or more disposed to insist that institutions exist for men and not men for institutions he joins hands here with the utilitarian radicals like them his face is to the future like them his eye is on results like them he believes that institutions exist for men like them he magnifies the public good barring its hedonism against which he waged a lifelong war he does generous justice to the practical value of utilitarianism as a political creed but there is a difference for whereas with it the emphasis is laid on happiness with green it lies unmistakably upon the development of individual character the value of the institutions of civil life he says in his principles of political obligation lies in their operation as giving reality to the capacities of will and reason and enabling them to be really exercised so far as they do in fact thus operate they are morally justified this is a characteristic passage it touches one of his strongest convictions the conviction that institutions justify their existence only in and so far as they live in the lives of men or if the phrase is permissible are born again and ever again in the souls of citizens it is a needful doctrine because it is so constantly forgotten for institutions is a word which sets the mind running to buildings officials endowments charters constitutions perhaps also founders records and traditions well and good but these things do not constitute an institution in its essence they may all be there in institutions that are antiquated decaying or dead one thing is still lacking the life the spiritual bond for the essence of an institution be it a friendly society a political club a charitable organization a learned society is that it is the material embodiment of some settled planned end or purpose in which many minds and many wills unite and find a meeting ground for action it is not even by what it does for the world outside of it much as this may be that we ought to estimate an institution the still more conclusive criterion lies in what it is doing for the wills and characters of those who in union of thought sentiment and purpose are the institution through participation in its life it is after this fashion that green regards institutions he vitalizes them he humanizes them he moralizes them as we read his pages they cease to be mere pieces of social structure or bits of social mechanism they become instinct with life and will nor is it ever enough to prove that they exist for the public good or the greatest happiness though that is much to be able to say not at any rate till we are able to translate these large abstractions into terms of the concrete good of individual citizens who already or in days to come will stand upon the earth the common good is doubtless an imposing phrase and green constantly makes use of it so is greatest happiness so is humanity they have all done duty often enough as watchwords and generalizations nor is there any reason why they should cease to do so but let no one think that he understands what they truly are as actual objects of value endeavour and sacrifice till he has learnt to look through the symbolism of the terms and to see behind them the lives of men this is the essence of green's teaching here it comes to light decisively in the prolegomena to ethics where he is discussing the nature of the ultimate end the suggestion is there made that the ultimate end is the good of the nation in a sense green does not dispute it he was convinced that no life worth living is possible without institutions and that the life most worth living is that which finds at once its nurture and its sphere of realization in that supreme institution the organized state as disciple of aristotle and hegel he was quick to see that the individual becomes an abstract figment 
if set over against society in a spurious independence and impossible isolation. The comparatively atomic individualism of Mill is far from him. But he was equally convinced that the nation in its turn is an abstraction no less delusive, if it be erected into an end in itself in forgetfulness or subordination of the individual lives which in organized union are the nation. His words leave us in no uncertainty. The life of the nation, he writes, has no real existence except as the life of the individuals composing the nation. Or again, in words that are even stronger as they are more sweeping, to speak of any progress or improvement or development of a nation or society or mankind, except as relative to some greater worth of persons, is to use words without meaning. A nation, it is true, and even a specific institution within a nation, may call upon the citizen to sacrifice himself, even to life itself. Green was the last man to dispute it. Nor was there any reason in his doctrine why he should. Contrarywise, for the justification of such sacrifices never terminates in the added wealth, power, prestige, or stability the nation may gain by them. All these things, like the nation which they characterize, are themselves abstractions, eviscerated of their real content, until they are translated into terms of betterment for persons somewhere and somehow. The truth is that according to the teaching of the prolegomena, there is but one place in which, by reason of its very nature, the ultimate good for man can reside, because there is but one place in which it can find realization, and that is in the wills and characters of individuals. For the good, as Green conceives it, is a spiritual good, a dutiful attitude of will, a right state of character, and however many the material conditions it may need as its instruments, it is in the lives of men and women that it can alone find its dwelling place. This is the ultimate ground of what we may fitly call Green's individualism. It has no kinship with the individualism that suggests an attitude of hostility to governmental interference, nor with the impossible individualism of self-regarding acts as taught by Mill, nor with the individualism implied in the Benthamite conception of society as an aggregate of units. Yet if it be individualism to see habitually in every political movement the fate of human beings, and in every controversy over institutions, the weal or woe of fellow citizens, then there are few more declared individualists in political philosophy than Green. End of section 23. Section 24 of Six Radical Thinkers by John McCunn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 6. The Political Idealism of T. H. Green. Part 4. This is doctrine which democracy can ill afford to forget. The political world is all too apt, falling a prey to metaphor, to speak of the national spirit, the national sentiment, the national conscience, the national will, as if a nation and even humanity were actually a person that could think and feel. It is wholesome to be reminded that a national sentiment must be felt by individuals, or must cease to exist, and that a national will becomes real only when actualized in the concrete wills of citizens. A national will, it is true, is not a mere aggregate of individual wills, as Rousseau reminds us. Aggregate is not the word for the organized union of a civilized people. Yet it remains the fact that it is in and through the wills of persons, despite all their vagaries and futilities, that a nation's will finds its substance and its force. It is one thing, however, thus to insist that institutions exist for men and live in their minds and characters. It is another to believe that institutions ought to be democratic. And it is, of course, just this latter point that most concerns us in the philosophy of Green. 
for that these two things may be dissevered is proved by a supreme instance where did political institutions more intensely vitalize the lives of citizens and where did the wills and sentiments of citizens more intensely vitalize political institutions than in ancient athens athens where at least four to one of the population were as slaves and chattels shut out from the constitution altogether and where therefore one of the institutions that vitalized the lives of the privileged minority was the institution of slavery now greatly as green admired the civic spirit of greece it is not to be supposed that he was prepared to follow even plato and aristotle here hence his problem which is also our problem to wit how to unite the intense civic spirit of the ancient world with modern democratic aspirations how to realize under modern conditions that organic union between the citizen and civic institutions which made athens great and free political institutions are much to no writer are they more than they are to green but why must they be democratic why must they exist not for caste or class as they did in those so-called democracies of greece but for the rank and file irrespective of caste class or creed now it is not necessary to claim for green that he approached this problem in the dry light of the understanding only on the contrary it lies on the surface of his life that his personal sympathies were strongly democratic the noblest feature of his character says one of his friends was a serious sympathy with the wrongs and sufferings of the poor not only did he hate slavery with a perfect hatred and glory in its extinction in america even at price of bloody civil war his sympathies were not less stirred by the spectacle of the untaught and underfed denizen of a london yard with gin shops on the right hand and on the left he had nothing short of a horror of the growth of a degraded and poverty-stricken proletariat another friend remarks about his love for social equality and his sense of the dignity of simple human nature it was especially to plain people says still another intimate to people of the middle and lower classes rather than of the upper that he was drawn the blot he most detested in english society was its pervading flunkeyism never we may add was there a man freer from the foolish fancied superiorities which sometimes education arrogates over the uncultured it was not even genius though no one reverent genius more that most drew his sympathies it was character it was the good neighbor and honest citizen he was a man who always believed and taught that neither class culture nor creed should divide men those of us he once said in an address to university men to whom university life is an avenue to the great world would do well betimes to seek opportunities of cooperation with those simple christians whose creed though we may not be able exactly to adopt it is to them the natural expression of a spirit which at the bottom of our heart we recognize as higher than our own in the everyday life of christian citizenship in its struggle against ignorance and vice such opportunities are readily forthcoming but of course it was not upon sympathies that green's democratic doctrine was built the entire drift of his essay on popular philosophy in relation to life is to tear the mask from the philosophies of feeling that ended logically in the destructive sentimentalism of rousseau in life we may feel but in philosophy we must think and the appeal of green as thinker is to reason he believed in democracy because he thought that he could give reasons for the democratic faith that was in him he sometimes demurred to be called hegelian he even explicitly avowed his divergence from hegelianism but he was certainly hegelian to the core in his appeal to reason for green substantially accepted what we might call the great magna carta of democracy as this stands written in the philosophy of kant with kant 
he believes that every man as a being endowed with reason and will is indefeasibly entitled to respect not the emotional respect which it may be quite beyond our power to feel for very many members of the community but the practical respect which invests the persons to whom it is paid with the title always to be dealt with as ends in themselves and never to be dealt with like slaves or chattels as mere means to the ends of others that every person possesses a worth and dignity which forbids his exploitation for political or any other ends this is the doctrine of green as it is of kant there are however differences it is the well-known limitation of kant that he fails to do justice to human feelings and desires the respect which is due from man to man would on his view be better described as indeed it is described by him as respect for the august moral law the law of duty for duty's sake which every good man is supposed consciously to exemplify as for natural feelings inclinations desires aspirations there is nothing in them particularly to move us to respect this is his fatal flaw kant wished to improve upon rousseau with whom he seems at one time to have been in strong accord he was dissatisfied with feeling as the root of personality and so he turned to reason but in turning to reason he turned away from the natural man altogether and declared for an asceticism that magnified reason by trampling on the desires and feelings with green it is otherwise his analysis of will is different on no point is he firmer or more insistent than that in human feeling and desire as such and therefore in the natural feelings and desires of men however rude and uncultivated there lie the germs or potentialities of those higher moral powers of will and conscience to which when we find them in their maturity we dare not withhold recognition and respect green constantly returns to this point he is insistent almost to weariness in his contention that between the merely animal appetites and the desires and feelings of a human being there is a world of difference and the difference lies in this that in the desires and feelings even of the slave and the savage the eye of analysis can discern as it can never discern in the appetites of animals the first faint beginnings and far-off promise which under the civilizing influence of sound institutions can finally be transformed into civic character it is in this light that green always regards both the less developed races and the less developed members of a civilized community he is resolute to look at them always as they are he is under no illusions about them he knew their frailties and their follies his eye is the eye of the analyst but in looking at them as they are he insists upon judging them and estimating them in the light of what they have it in them to become for that surely is also part is it not in truth the most important part of what they are and it is because he thus regards them with the eye at once of the analyst and the idealist that he bids us render even to the humblest of our species that same practical respect which we never think of withholding when thanks to the civilizing influence of free institutions the potentialities of the savage and the slave have become the realized morality of the good neighbor and honest citizen this is the justification of green's broad and unfaltering democratic sympathies we said he hated slavery why because he saw in the slave neither animated chattel nor serviceable animal but the marring of a moral and social being we saw that he had a horror of a proletariat he well might a proletariat could be nothing else in his eyes but an index of the failure of civilization we saw he has as a salient feature of his character a sympathy with the wrongs and sufferings of the poor but it was not the facile sympathy of pity far less the degrading twice-cursed sympathy of patronage 
it was the rational and practical sympathy which regarded grinding poverty squalor disease thriftlessness drunkenness and vice in all its forms as deplorable obstructions to that decent and self-respecting life of citizenship by the capacity for which the man is decisively differentiated from the brute green was far from unappreciative of the sympathy of sentiment though he had an intense repugnance to sentimentality but it was not enough for his was the sympathy of a profoundly matter-of-fact yet ever aspiring nature which worked for popular causes because not all the brutalization of savagery or slavery nor all the degradation of civilized cities could shake his analytic estimate of what human nature had it in it to become it was a matter-of-fact idealism that kind of idealism which believes that in beings capable of development the far results are the true realities which can see in beginnings the prophecy of ends and in potentialities the promise of actualities or to translate abstract terms into more concrete phrase which can see in a country ditcher or a dock labourer the makings of a citizen nor must we forget that there is a further point which though it marks a decided divergence from kant nevertheless strengthens green in his agreement with the kantian doctrine of the worth and dignity of the individual though far from hostile to theism kant is peculiarly jealous of anything that implies dependence of the human will on god such dependence seems to him to imperil that autonomy of the will which he takes to be of the essence of morality far otherwise with green to him the dependence of the finite spirit upon god is fundamental it is the source of all consolation aspiration and hope it is the prime condition of that belief in ideals and that salutary contrast between the ideal and the actual in which as we have seen lies the nerve of progress this being so green falls at once into line with those thinkers whose radicalism is religious religious radical is what nettleship calls him nor can there be any doubt that the designation fits for it is evident that to green as to mazzini with whom he is upon so many points at one respect for men is inseparably interwoven with the belief that mankind in their divine discontent in their spiritual cravings for betterment in their service of ideals participate the platonic metaphor is also green's in the very life of god mazzini's watchword god and the people is perhaps not a phrase which green would have cared to use the reasoning sobriety of his thought is in marked contrast to the unrestrained intuitive appeal of mazzini but no reader can doubt that upon his own grounds he was in profound sympathy with that watchword of the great political saint of italy we are now in a position better to understand why to his belief in the value of institutions green added the belief that the benefits of institutions must be extended to all saturated with the civic spirit of the political thinkers of greece confirmed in it by the hegelian doctrine drawn largely from greece that it is by losing himself in the life of citizenship that the individual truly finds himself convinced therefore if he was convinced of anything that the lives of men are atrophied when civil and political rights are denied them he felt constrained to work for the coming of the day when all the lord's people should be prophets or in less metaphysical language when the english artisan and agricultural labourer stigmatized by the foes of democracy as roughs and clowns would prove their capacity for the manly virtues that thrive upon the soil of active citizenship in eighteen sixty eight green made a speech in oxford about the recently extended franchise he refused to view it in any narrow spirit as a gain for his party or as the forging of a political instrument for realizing further reforms he took higher stronger ground we who were reformers from the beginning always said that the enfranchisement of the people was an end in itself we said and we were much derided for saying so that citizenship only 
makes the moral man, that citizenship only gives that self-respect which is the true basis of respect of others, and without which there is no lasting social order or real morality. And to the waverers, the doubters, the alarmists, who have never since the beginning been wanting to all extensions of popular liberties, he has a short answer. Untie the man's legs, and then it will be time to speculate how he will walk. Henry Sidgwick, in a recently published posthumous volume, has criticized Green severely for reading into his interpretation of the Aristotelian virtues, especially the virtues of courage and self-control, more of the civic spirit than is to be found in Aristotle himself. Be it so, we cannot now stop to argue the point, even though we may venture to suggest that the criticism is controvertible. Let us welcome it as at any rate a proof that we have here an English Aristotle more civic in spirit than even that Greek Aristotle who declared that man was by nature a citizen, and who above all others has taught mankind that the moral salvation of the individual lies in the life of citizenship. If there are those to whom this democratic faith seems all too sanguine and even visionary, they may at any rate rest assured that Green was not the man to underrate misgivings or to deny that these have grounds. If we call him optimist, his optimism was neither so glowing as Mazzini's nor so elastic as Mill's. He was cautious of putting down his foot. He was not a visionary. Sober mindedness, as we have seen, was a note of his character. He was not romantic. His outlook on life was subdued even to sadness. He saw with a penetrating and pitying eye into the mixed motives, the egotisms, the weaknesses and meannesses of mankind. But the result was not misgivings as to his ideals, for that would have meant a repudiation of his whole philosophy, but the recognition of the fact that their realization meant work and sacrifice. End of section 24. Section 25 of Six Radical Thinkers by John McCunn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 6 The Political Idealism of T. H. Green. Part 5. There is a way of talking of democracy as if it had nothing to do but to give, as if political liberties were boons, gifts, or largesses and the democratic citizen a beneficiary of blessings which free institutions showered upon his head. It may not be entirely false, but only too often it disastrously hides the fact that under democratic institutions it is the citizen who gives most who gets most. Not in the whole circle of institutions from the family onwards is there one which will render up its benefits except to the citizen who gives his best and his utmost to active service. It is so with the humblest political club. Little it gives, and something less than nothing, to its members, unless they strive for the causes for which it exists. So with the great municipality. It is not the passive citizen who gains most of what his city has to give, even when he is well governed and lightly rated. It is the men who play their part, the active citizens who widen and enrich their lives through interest and work in public causes. This holds throughout, from the service of a vestry to that of an empire. It is active citizenship alone that reaps the harvest. Nor is it the commonwealth that is most defrauded by the political indifference and private selfishness deplored of moralists which are ready to take everything and render nothing in return. The commonwealth can thrive without its drones. The certain losers are the men themselves in whose self-centered and contracted lives such private virtues as may come will but poorly compensate for the lack of civic courage, political integrity, public spirit, political comradeship, patriotism. Shining indeed would the private virtues and graces of life need to be 
if they were to be accepted in full as the equivalent of the manly qualities which are born and bred only of active citizenship. This, at any rate, is the political message of Green. It is not enough for him that men should be loyal citizens. He would have them become intelligent patriots, in whom an appreciation of social ends has awakened a passion to serve their country. If the individual is to have a higher feeling of political duty, so runs his demand, he must take part in the work of the state. For it was not the gift of citizenship he really valued, it was the use to be made of the gift. It was not even the popular causes for the sake of which he shortened his own days, it was the evolution of civic character which he believed the pursuit of these causes carried in its train. Nor was it upon democracy, as an instrument for redressing wrongs and deposing privilege and monopoly, or as a form of government, that his heart was chiefly set. It was on democracy as a state of social relations, in which respect would have become the normal attitude of man to man, because then the citizen would have proved his title to respect by his civic spirit and civic service. This will be clearer if we turn from these generalities to two specific applications of Green's doctrine, and first to his justification of rights. The central feature in Green's theory of civil and political rights is that it rests on his doctrine of political duty. This comes out in his comments on the old revolutionary doctrine of natural rights, the rights of man, of which Rousseau was the parent and Paine the prophet. His remark about these men is that they were so taken up with innate rights that they somehow seemed to have forgotten innate duties. And though we must not press this to mean that Green thought that any man is born into the world with a code of duties all complete, for this would be just as dogmatic as the dogmatism of rights, it is still significant of the conviction that of the two conceptions, right and duty, it is duty that is the more fundamental of the two. To say, nature or God, with the apostles of the rights of man it was sometimes one and sometimes the other, gives me rights, and therefore it is your duty to respect them, is a strong statement. But it is, to say the least, neither so strong nor so much in harmony with fact as to say, nature or God has given me the capacity for duty, and in order to get my duty done, I claim my rights. And it is just this that is Green's, as it is Kant's contention. He is not content to claim rights. Anyone can do that. And it does not better the claim one wit when it is made in the name of nature or God. What is needful is proof. Proof that the claims are just and reasonable. Green is at one with Bentham here. It is proof he seeks to give, and he finds it, not indeed where Bentham finds it, but in the argument that when any man is denied his rights, to that man, the capacity to do his duty is frustrate and abortive, because without rights, a human being lacks the opportunities which lie upon the very threshold of moral development and the dutiful life. It is the same point that has emerged throughout. For it is not because Green ever thinks that the right to life or to property or to reputation, or the right to vote or any other right, civil or political, is an end in itself, that he argues through many pages for rights. Here is elsewhere he is idealist. He argues for rights in the light of what he believes men have it in them through rights to become. For it is not in the origin of man, for that is lowly and brutish enough, but in his moral destiny, which is neither lowly nor brutish, that he finds the true justification of rights. It is upon the inherent capacities of the human spirit for social duties, it is upon the consciousness of spiritual cravings which claim kindred with the source of all good that all Green's argument turns. For rights are not gifts, nor boons, nor congenital possessions. They are simply opportunities, or advantages, or positions for the exercise of powers, in which the members of a community, 
in the pursuit of a common good, struggle on to be secured by the sanctions of law or custom, in order that upon that assured standing ground they may begin to fulfil those duties, and thereby to realise those ideals which are of the essence of man as a moral and religious being. True rights, so runs his definition, are powers, which it is for the general well-being that the individual or association should possess, and that well-being is essentially a moral well-being. It is not often that the philosophical justification of human struggles and aspirations furnishes mankind with fresh incentives. It seems an accepted commonplace that at the very touch of philosophical analysis and explanation, the glow and passion of life evaporate. And Green himself was among the thinkers who are quick, perhaps too quick, to disclaim the notion that discourses upon morality can make men more moral, or theories in politics make better citizens. Nor is any one likely to find in the severely reasoned pages of the principles of political obligation any of the rhetorical appeal that is usually supposed necessary to stir and sustain the passion for reform. And yet, when one rises from Green's pages and passes in review all the motives that have inspired the long struggle for rights, the sting of oppression, the sense of injustice, the hatred of class for class, the hunger for independence, the longing for security, the craving for power, the pursuit of happiness. One wonders if all of them put together can furnish a thinking man with a stronger incentive to work for his own rights and the rights of his fellow citizens than this philosopher's reasoned proof that he who is content to take less than his rights is a moral apostate because he is consenting to be denied the bare elementary conditions of that life of dutiful self-realization through civic functions which parts the free citizen from the slave. The same line of thought lies also at the root of Green's conception of freedom. Democracy has won emancipation. Has it not emancipated the slave, the artisan, the peasant? But emancipation is not freedom. It is but a step toward it. For whereas emancipation may come at a stroke, freedom has to be earned by all its sons. Only those can win it who have proved that they deserve it. Nor will it ever come, because in truth it cannot come in reality and substance, and not merely in name and form, till the mere escape from thraldom, much as that is, has been followed up by the positive and satisfying fruition of what the life of liberty has to give. As with emancipation, so with rights. The possession of rights is not freedom. This was the message of Green as it was of Mazzini. For actual freedom is found only in that satisfying fulfillment of civic duties to which rights, however precious, are but the vestibule. This is the characteristic view of Green. His eye always on substantial freedom. It is not free institutions alone, nor rights alone, nor immunity from interference alone that can satisfy him. Nothing will satisfy him but the fuller and better life into which the citizen comes when all these preliminaries have opened the way. His definition of freedom shows this. Carlyle and Mazzini were wont to say that freedom stood in need of new definitions. Green gives us one. Freedom is a positive power or capacity of doing or enjoying something worth doing or enjoying, and that, too, something that we do or enjoy in common with others. This does but reveal, in another form, the same spirit we have seen running through all his thought, the same unwillingness to rest in abstractions, the same refusal to accept form for substance, the same passion for what is concrete, actual, real. To him, the only genuine free man is the fully developed man and citizen, and all who come short of this are still but freemen in the making. Hence his attitude on a question that has now for some time divided the radical camp, and seems fated to divide it more. The vexed question 
of state intervention. It is Green's merit here to steer steadily a course of his own. He is neither for state intervention like the socialist, nor against it like Bright and Cobden. But this comes not of compromise, but of principle, and it is above all determined by his conception of freedom. The end on which his eye is here as elsewhere fixed is the development of the character of the citizen, the power on the part of all men equally to make the most and the best of themselves. Show that state intervention hinders this, and he will repudiate it with more than the antipathy of Cobden. Show that it is thwarted or delayed by laissez-faire, and he hesitates not a moment to set laissez-faire aside as a thing whose day is done, despite all the cherished traditions of the Manchester School. His favorite formula here is removal of obstructions, and if we went no further than the phrase we might seem to be but echoing the counsels of Cobden. Yet the difference is decisive. For it is not of the number or the magnitude of legal restraints he thinks first of all. Drastic legal intervention does not disconcert him in the least. The whole question for him turns on the issue whether legal restraints, be they few or many, make for that fuller and richer life of citizenship which constitutes a positive and substantial freedom. Removal of obstructions is a phrase which on his pages must always be interpreted in the light of his recognition of the individual capacities, potentialities, and ideals which are pressing for development. We can see this in a crucial instance. The national vice which he most deplored was drunkenness, and the control of the liquor traffic was the question upon which, above all others, he probably felt most intensely. His practical conclusion is not left doubtful. This, then, he says, in the reasoning address upon liberal legislation and freedom of contract, which he delivered in 1881. It was one of his latest utterances. This, then, along with the effective liberation of the soil, is the next great conquest which our democracy, on behalf of its own true freedom, has to make. The danger of legislation either in the interests of a privileged class or for the promotion of particular religious opinions we may fairly assume to be over. The popular jealousy of law, once justifiable enough, is therefore out of date. The citizens of England now make its law. We ask them by law to put a restraint on themselves in the matter of strong drink. We ask them further to limit or even altogether to give up the not very precious liberty of buying and selling alcohol in order that they may become more free to exercise the faculties and improve the talents which God has given them. This utterance has an application far beyond the question that evoked it, for Green was ready to welcome with a warmth which would have scandalized Brighter Cobden or Spencer all democratic legislation which would sweep out of the path of the citizen the malign obstructions that come of ignorance, disease, squalor, culpable carelessness, and fraud as well as drunkenness. Factory Acts, Education Acts, Adulteration Acts, Irish Land Acts, met with his vehement approval. They implied compulsions, and of course he knew it. But then he was not averse to that under a democratic regime. His fellow citizens should, to use Rousseau's phrase, be legally forced to be free, provided that the action of the law went out to meet moral and civic potentialities which were genuinely struggling to find a fuller realization than was possible under the fancied liberty but real bondage of a laissez-faire dispensation. So far as one can see, he did not share Mill's dread of the possible tyranny of the majority, or if he did, he was not blind to what he once called the real greatness of Mill. Misgivings were overcome by his confidence in the democratic state. And yet he was far enough from being prepared to give the state carte blanche. It would certainly be a misnomer to call him in any accurate signification socialistic. 
His justification of the right of private property carries with it quite explicitly a strong plea for private capital. Keenly sympathetic with the cause of labor, and acutely alive to the dangers and the degradation that accompany the growth of an impoverished proletariat, he yet declines, he calls it unfair, to lay upon capitalism the admitted evils for which socialism offers itself as a remedy. Equality of wealth is no part of his ideal. It is incompatible with it. For, as private property is on his view justified because it is an instrument for the realization of human capacities, nothing can be more reasonable than that the inevitable inequalities of capacity, which diversify the face of society, should find their counterpart in inequalities of riches even to the length of large accumulations in private hands. He has, therefore, no misgivings as to the spectacle of the large fortunes that are incidents of trade. His misgivings awaken only when he comes to property in land. For he turns the very arguments which justify what he calls the free development of individual wealth in other things into an indictment of an equally uncontrolled ownership of land. For he could not think that landlordism in its present form, at any rate in England, was fitted to foster free citizenship. On the contrary, he was convinced that by monopolizing a commodity definitely limited in amount, it had gone far to sacrifice the landless many to the landed few. Nor can there be a doubt that he was what would usually be called an agrarian radical. But he did not attack private property and land. He did not wish for state proprietorship. He did not consider even the appropriation of the unearned increment, though fair enough in itself, as desirable. He argued for nothing more radical than a legal control over the landed interest so that tenant farmer, and more especially agricultural laborer, might better realize the right to free life. Socialism, however, was not a subject upon which Green directly expressed himself, and his judgment on it, he could hardly have left a more valuable legacy to radicalism, must remain partly matter of conjecture. But be this as it may, it is certain enough that none of all our political writers has held stronger views as to the inevitable limitations to state intervention in some of the gravest concerns of life. This comes out in his exposure of the impotence of law directly to promote either religion or morality. His point here is substantially the same as that already urged in criticism of Mill. It turns on the spirituality of his conception of human life. For this leads him to a plea for laissez-faire which is more thoroughgoing, though less sweeping, than that of even Bright and Cobden. His argument is that no state authority, be its sanctions never so compulsive, can produce that attitude of the individual soul to God without which all genuine religion vanishes, and just as little can it create that inward dutiful state of will without which conduct cannot rise above the low level of a meagre moral legality. It is as impotent here as it is in the domain of speculative thought and philosophical belief. Outward conformity, of course, it may secure, if its sanctions be sufficiently formidable. But the maximum of outward conformity may fail altogether to ensure the minimum of genuine religion and real morality. He goes further, for he is so jealous for sincerity and purity of motive that he sounds a warning note against attempts to enforce even such moral and religious actions as might be within the competence of the law. For however unexceptionable such actions might be, they would, he fears, drop at once in moral worth through the vitiation of the springs of action which is apt to come whenever the doing of right actions is even partially due to fear of punishment. On similar grounds, he has a deep distrust of anything approaching inquisitorial intervention of law in family life. It is not that he is in the least disposed to clothe the heads of households with any fancied rights of domestic despotism, 
he was willing enough to compel parents to educate children. His reason lies in the conviction that the family tie, as it ought to be, is so much a matter of mutual trust, sympathy, and affection, that it is an ultimate impossibility to do much for it by attempting to regulate by law, beyond narrow limits, the intimate, delicate relations of husband and wife or parent and child. This is a line of thought that impresses by far the most effective limits upon the functions of government, for it is not for government, though it be the wisest and strongest that ever shaped itself before the political imagination, to try to create the spiritual and moral life of its citizens. Its function is the more modest and more practicable task of removing obstructions to the development of lives fed and nurtured on higher things. The claim to the helping hand of the state, so freely and often so reasonably made in these latter days, is only justified if those on whose behalf the claim is made have within them powers and cravings which the state can indeed help to satisfy, but which it does not create. It is in proportion as these powers and cravings are likely to come out to meet what public demand does to foster them that the intervention of the state becomes justifiable. The helping hand of government must find the responsive grasp of real needs and genuine potentialities. This is the truth that underlies the formula removal of obstructions. The formula, to be sure, is not faultless. It is not easy to find a place in it for every instance in which the action of public authorities is universally welcomed. When, for example, one has wandered amongst the treasures of a British museum, or even visited a well-equipped public elementary school, or crept from under the smoke of city streets to a green and leafy public park, it is not enough to reflect that these things mean removal of obstructions. The lamentable obstructions that come of ignorance or of dreary and debilitating surroundings. They also positively feed and nurture the instincts for knowledge and delight. Nor is it desirable to withhold from civic enterprise the incentives that come from that reflection. After all, however, the issue here is largely verbal. Let those who can improve upon Green's formula. Meanwhile, the central point remains that whatever the state or the municipality may in the future do for the citizen, it will be but as water spilt on sand if the men of the democracy do not bring to the appropriation of it that real desire for betterment and that genuine aspiration after the life of the good neighbor and honest citizen of which this truly philosophical radical was the prophet end of section twenty five recording by pamela nagami m d in encino california january twenty twenty one End of Six Radical Thinkers, Bentham, J. S. Mill, Cobden, Carlyle, Mazzini, T. H. Green, by John McCunn.